Okay, guys, I'm going to go over the presentation we had at Journal Club on Kaplan Meyer survival curves. This is accompanying the paper from the British Medical Journal that Jason sent out um, asking you to think about these things. And I'll tell you, they're not the easiest uh, when you're first looking at it, but after a, a real brief explanation of really what they are, I think it's, it's going to be uh, pretty easy for you. Um, the three statements in the BMJ that he's asking you to look at and try to figure out which one is right and wrong, they're not really intuitive. I mean, I think they all kind of look right. E anyone could be a trick answer. Um, and the explanation requires a little bit more uh, for me because I'm not a stats guy. Uh, so I went a little deeper um, and I found some, uh, some gold to understanding these curves. The ones shown here are from the actual BMJ paper. I mean, we really want this to just be everyone alive on the left and some percentage of those people alive on the right. And it isn't really what it's showing, um, and that's. Uh, but it is simple, um, I, I promise. So, uh, if you remember from high school stats class, this dude, uh, me, I'm sure, uh, right? This is from Ferris Bueller. Uh, some stats stuff, real simple statistics. I mean, real simple. Uh, they taught me using this uh, six-sided die. Pretty familiar. I was a nerd playing D and D, so the dice made sense. So here, what are the odds of rolling a one on a six-sided die? Just one and six, right? There's six possible outcomes, and one of them is the one you want. One and six. Easy, right? So now let's say you got two different dice. And what are the odds of rolling a one on the first dice and then rolling a one on the second dice? Now, this part I still kind of understood probability, but anything further was beyond me. Thankfully, this is as complicated as the Captain Meyer curve actually gets. So the first die roll, right, it could be a one. Right? And then the second die roll could be a 1. Yay, that's what we're looking for, right? There's the event. Or right, the first die roll could be a 1, and the second one could be a 2. Or the second one could be a 3, or a 4, or a 5, or a 6. The first dice could come up a 2, and the second one could come up a 1. Or a 2 and a 2, a 2 and a 3, or a 2 and a 4. You get the idea, right? And the total possible outcomes here, if you count them all up, there are 36. And you want just the one outcome. So your odds of this happening out of the total number of outcomes is one out of 36. And that's kind of intuitive. I mean, it makes, it makes sense when you think about it like that. And if in the future you've got harder math to do and you don't want to calculate out how many different possibilities there are, you can remember the odds of these events happening, one event happening, and then the next event also happening, um, the and part uh, gives you multiplication. So you can just do 1 and 6 times 1 and 6 to get the 1 and 36. Um, you could really go nuts and say, what are the odds of rolling 10 ones in a row? And it'd be 1 and 6 times 1 and 6 times 1 and 6 times all 10 times, and that's 0.00001%. So that's not too hard, right? I, just, I don't think so. And um, That's really all a Kaplan-Meyer curve is. <laughs> Thank God, it's just showing that math in pictorial form. So let's keep the math simple, and let's say we got 100 patients uh, that are in a trial, um, and our intervention is going to be to give them continuous foundations experiences uh, and just see how many survive. Uh, here's your clockwork orange reference. Um, Jeremy, don't hate me too much for this. Uh, so on the uh, y-axis, you've got this thing on every capital Meyer curve called survivor probability. That's just the dice multiplication we did. And on the x-axis, we've got time. Right, so this is how they draw it out. So here, at the beginning of the trial, we got 100 people are alive, right? Uh, and then in a month out, uh, the director of foundations curriculum loses his mind when someone shows up late and kills one of our patients. All right, so that's an event on the Kaplan-Meier graph. Um, and there's a little vertical line. And on every Kaplan-Meier curve, that vertical line tells you that an event occurred. And that could have happened in a month. It could have happened in two months. It could have happened, I mean, who knows? But universally, on all Kaplan-Meier curves, all the vertical lines are events. That's interesting. Already, you can look at this thing when you first see a Kaplan-Meier curve in a study. You can get an idea of how frequently events are actually happening in the study. I mean, if the event is death, you can actually watch and see how frequently these little lines occur. And the more lines you've got, the more events. So that means the more people were actually in the study. So beware of studies that have very few events, because they don't likely have a lot of subjects in it. Let me take a look here. Right on the left here, we, we don't have very many events altogether, 12 or 13 of them. And, 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 and we do get to zero. All the patients in this arm died. right? And there were a couple events here, too. 
right? but not very many events overall. So probably not many patients in this study. How powered is that? Well, it's a good question, right? Maybe that's not as useful a study as like this one, where wow, look at all of the events, right, running through running through all three arms of this trial. So interesting. You could already see some stuff just by knowing that simple fact that the vertical lines are the events. So back to our study. Um, let's say uh, somebody else dies at a month and a half out. Um, and there's a second little line and time continues, and then like some other weak resident croaks at two and a half months. There's your weak resident, this is Doug from Scrubs. Anyhow, just like the dice, the distance you go down this graph in these little vertical lines is going to tell you the odds of surviving past that event. It just shows you the math. Right? The dice, excuse me, one in six times one in six times one in six. Right, but here in this first event, right, we had 100 out of 100. Uh, and then the and then, at, then after the event there were 99 out of 100, so the odds of surviving to the first event were 100 out of 100, so 100 percent. The odds of making it past the event uh, were the 99 over 100. Um, they're just the two odds multiplied together, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, do note the denominator dropped by one um, during the next period because someone died during that last event, so the total number of possible patients was less by one, um, 100 over 100. 9 over 100, number drop, 98 over 99, 97 over 98. Good. And here we see the odds of surviving up to the fourth event, 97%. And you can think of each of these events just like a dice roll. The graph, just drawing out the math pictorially. Not intuitive, but kind of cool once you know what it is. Uh, so really, what we know at the end of the capital matter curve are the odds that you survived all of the events. That's the odds that you lived to have the event, in this case death, happen at a later date. So if you're following along with the BMJ article that Jason sent out, this is why B is the correct answer. It's that funky wording that says they lived to experience the date at a later, a death at a later date. And that's the correct answer. Okay, so that's not hard. There's one other thing that happens in the studies uh, that is shown sort of on the capital Meyer curve. It isn't shown actually on the BMJ article. Um, but it is shown everywhere else, and that is patients drop out. They are lost to follow-up. This happens in every trial, and their data, therefore, gets censored from the next event. And that's why the first statement is wrong from the BMJ article. We're actually missing some people in the math by the end, so the percentage isn't just the total percentage of survivors. Let's say our study just ended here, for example, um, and say that some, but let's say that sometime after that first event, the patient was lost to follow-up. At the time of the second event, right, so after the first event, somewhere in here, the patient was lost to follow-up. And at the time of the second event, the researchers check their follow-up notes and they go, oh, we've, we've lost someone who's dropped out. The numerator drops by one because somebody died, but for the next segment, right, for the next segment, and so does the denominator. Uh, for the segment after that, right, both the numerator and denominator are less again by one because of that censored patient. So instead of 100 over 100 times 99 over 100 times 98 over 99, 97 over 98, we have 100 over 100 times 99 over 100, and then we drop. The 99 was going to go to 98, but censored event, somebody died, so we get to 97. The 100 was supposed to go to 99, but we have another death, so we get down to 98, and then continue from there, 96 over 97. And wow, what, I mean, what a difference. I mean, it makes the whole percentage point here. Uh, censoring these patients um, from the data really does change the math, and it always is going to make the survival probability look a little bit higher. And that's why, after the first censoring, this whole thing really is an estimate. I mean, in this little study with only a few events, right, and stopped early, the censoring changed the estimation by, by one percentage point. Um, so, if there had been no censored patients, we could have said that you had a 90% chance of surviving all of the events out of 100. Yeah, 97 would have lived, which is what the answer, the first answer uh, from the BMJ article, answer A, was saying. But if you have a single censored patient, you can't make that assumption, right? You can't, I mean, you, you can't say that 97.95% of the group didn't experience death by the end. If you had somebody drop out, you have no idea what happened to them. So how do you know if you've got a censored patient? Well, there are two ways. The authors are supposed to show you each loss to follow-up as a little vertical tick along this horizontal segment. 
I mean, check out all the censored events, all the dropouts in this study on both both arms. Um, but you can also look at the number of number at risk down here, report on the bottom. Um, check it out for the section of the study between 48 months and 72 months. In the blue line here, there were no events, right? There are no vertical drops between 48 months and 72 drops. But look at all these little tick marks, right? And we went from 183 down to 50. So nobody died, no one experienced that event in the study, but 133 patients were lost to follow up and had to be censored from the study. And this brings up, a, I mean, this really illustrates a key point, right? The further out to the right of these curves, the more sensitive events you have to have just because time has gone on. And therefore, the less accurate this final number really is. In this particular trial, so, I mean, it really is a good example of that. They, they had only one patient left in the study following up at 120 months. Only one person left. The whole rest of the study at this point was lost to follow up. Right? They hadn't all died. Most, of the lo most were lost to follow up. But the last number to be multiplied over and over was, was 100%. Right, so putting their overall survival rate at a 92%. Right? But if the patient had died the next month, the reported survival would have been 0%. <laughs> Again, I, I'm pretty inaccurate, right? Uh, that's the crux of it. When somebody drops out, we can't say that they died. That's an event. So essentially, the study shrinks a little bit. With each censored dropout, the power of the study gets a little less, right? When that last we see that when the last person in the study dies, and the survivability, probably the survival probability drops to zero percent. It's not like everybody that started the trial is dead, right? It's only those that were left in the trial that died. And in this case, especially this case, right, with this study, most had dropped out. <laughs> so how really accurate can you say that that final number is, especially if you have most of your trial censored? I'd say not much. Uh, you see. You really have to look at how many patients are churning along in these studies. And so many have been lost to follow up, and there have been so few deaths. You really have to be careful how much importance you place on that final number, especially if you're trying to tell a patient what their odds are at something. All right. So the final point to make with these trophomonic curves is the answer to why C is wrong. Um, the, the, last, uh, the last answer is wrong. You have to remember that these are the odds of the group, right? Any single individual could have died at any point along here. So you can't say that all the members of one group did better uh, than all the members of the other group. You can say that on average they did. And what it really means is that when you look at these curves, we have to look at what you can get out of them. Right? You actually can get some stuff out of this, even if that last number isn't, uh, isn't perfectly accurate. Right? And what you can get is the shape of the curves. And those shape of the curves can be compared to each other pretty well, especially when you've got the same amount of censored or dropouts in both curves, as you kind of do here. There are a lot of censors in both. So you can actually compare the two um, curves to each other. So the 92% may be useless in this, uh, in this study, but you can say that in general, the patients uh, in the red group did better than patients in the blue group. Your odds would be, would be higher of survival in red, uh, red versus blue in this, uh, in, in this particular study. And we know that actually because you can do the same kind of statistical math that we do for comparing other uh, functions, right? We can we can do chi squared values, we can do hypothesis testing, we get p values, all that fun stuff. We can do it comparing the shape of these two curves. Right? I hope that makes sense for you. If you've got any questions, uh, just swing by the office. Happy to talk about it anytime.